I don't really know what to say next after that. Um, yeah. Well, welcome. We are glad you are here. This is our Family Worship Sunday. We do this a uh, few times the, out of the year where we gather young and, I'm not going to say old, but I'm going to say more mature, right? The young and more mature. So we are glad you are here to worship together. And so today we're going to be talking about one word, just one word. And if you understand what this one word is all about, then you have listened well. So kids, this one word we're going to talk about. Before we get there, though, let me tell you what we have been talking about the last couple of weeks. We've been talking about the church and uh, specifically what is church all about? The very first church and what did they have and what do we need to have in our church? And so we started looking at Acts chapter 2 and we started to trace. Anyone like to trace pictures out of newspapers or books or stuff? I do too. And growing up, I remember tracing pictures out of the newspaper on Sunday when it would come with the comic section. And my favorite thing to trace was this. Ziggy, right? And some of you are probably saying, you needed to trace that? Isn't it like pretty simple? I mean, it's not too much to Ziggy, right? But I remember tracing Ziggy and trying to get all the moves right and then showing it to people like, look what I did, right? Well, that's exactly what we're doing in the book of Acts. We're tracing to see what God's word has to see what it communicates to us so we can get the picture of what we're supposed to be doing. So two weeks ago, we said we are devoted to the word of God. We are devoted to it. We read it. We study it. God has protected it to come to us. So we can search it and read it and learn. Last week, Pastor Johnny talked about we are a church as we walk in step with the Spirit. We are following the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, as it nudges us, as we learn what it says in the Bible about the Holy Spirit. And as we, as believers, have the Spirit within us, we are being led by the Spirit. And so today we move into a third thing that our church needs to have. As we're tracing the picture of what it should look like, one word, koinonia. Koinonia. And you're probably thinking to yourself, wait a second, that doesn't even sound like an English word. You're right, it's not. It's a Greek word. It's a Greek word, koinonia. All the kids, let's say it together. Ready? One, two, three. Koin. Very good. Yeah, I like that. Very good. Koinonia. Yeah, this is a lively group. I like this. Well, before I tell you what koinonia is all about, um, let me say, let me just display something first. Um, and it has to deal with uh, something like maybe, who, ha who likes Kit Kats? Anyone like Kit Kats? Come on up. Come on up. Okay. Come on, Sam. You ready? All right. Come on up. And uh, you're going to uh, share with me Kit Kat. Go ahead. You sit right here. And um, can you open them up for us, too? I'll, I'll explain. Kit Kats are incredible. Uh, nice wafer, chocolate. Why do you like them so much? They taste good. They taste good. All right. That's all you have to know, really, about them. Are you, are you struggling? All right. Um, there we go. All right. Yeah, Kit Kats. I, I think they're incredible because it's the kind of thing where you could eat like a hundred of them and you don't really feel like you've eaten a lot, right? Kit Kats. Um, I just need one. Can I have one? There you go. You can have the rest of them. Mmm. We are sharing. No, no. We're going to share with each other. You know the best thing about being a pastor? I got to eat three of these today. It was awesome. Unlimited Kit Kats, all the hours. They're good, right? No other candy bar will like it. All right, you can take that, take that with you. Mm, I love Kit Kats. Now, what you have just experienced, you didn't realize it, but Koinonia just happened. And you're like, wait a second, I love this church. Eating chocolate? Is that Koinonia? I'm coming back, right? Koinonia is a Greek word that means to share something, to have in common, to have a bond, to have something together. And in that moment, Sam and I, we had that Kit Kat bond, right? We still do. We can go back to that memory. 
And you can have koinonia centered on anything, right? Your favorite sports team. Maybe it's the Buckeyes, right? Maybe it's um, your job. Maybe it's where you live, where you come from. You can have koinonia. But the very first church had koinonia, and it was centered upon one thing. Now, who can tell me what that one thing is? What, what is it? What did they share in common, do you think, that the early church? Jesus Christ? Very good. They shared God and Jesus Christ, the story of the gospel. See, they shared this together. And so that is something that is powerful. I mean, it's one thing to have koinonia over a Kit Kat, but to have koinonia centered on the gospel of Jesus Christ, that is quite another. And it is a thing that bind, binds us together. When you understand the story, right? The story is about Jesus Christ and having that as the center. Let, let me show you a verse in 1 John chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. If you have your Bible, you can look at it. If not, it's on the screen right here. We proclaim to you, this is what it says, we proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard so that you may have koinonia with us. And our koinonia is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that you may fully share our joy. Now you're thinking to yourself, hold on a second. I'm reading my Bible and I don't see this word koinonia, right? You probably see the word fellowship, but that's what the word is. And you know what it means now, this sharing, holding something in common, this bond. And so what John says here is that we first have this koinonia with the Father, our Heavenly Father. Okay, we have this bond with our Heavenly Father, this sharing. Let me ask you, what did he share with us? Our Heavenly Father shared. What did he share with us? Anyone know? Yeah. His son, Jesus Christ. Very good. That's the greatest thing he could have shared, right? He shared Jesus Christ. And so now those who believe that he shared his son, why? Because we're sinful people. And we need an answer for the sin in our lives. And that's only through Jesus Christ. And so because of that relationship that he has shared with us, notice what John says. Okay, ourselves have actually seen and have heard so that you may have koinonia with us. And John says this, for all those who proclaim the truth of the gospel and you share in that story, you now have this koinonia with other people. The shared experience is now to be expected when you come together. When the body of Christ comes together, it is a unique thing unlike any other group of people who come together. Why? Because we share the greatest thing in common. And so John tells us this, this truth to be known true. And so the next question is this. So when we come together as the church, how do we build up our koinonia? I mean, do we just kind of get in the same room together, or should we be doing certain things together to remind us of the greatest story that we share? You see, we could just come in this room and talk about the Browns or talk about the weather, but isn't there something more to the body coming together and having koinonia? What kind of things should we be about? Well, if we go back to the very first church, in Acts, as we're tracing to see what the kind of things they did, we know that very early on, Peter preached to them. They believed. And the next thing they did, right after that, starts with the letter B, many of them were what? Yeah, baptized. I said that last hour, and someone said banished. <laughs> it's the wrong B word. They were baptized. Why were they baptized? Well, they were then baptized to tell the story, to have this shared experience of telling the story to encourage one another. You see, baptism is an outward act that tells the story. It retells a story. And here's the story it tells. We have a person who will stand here in the water, and then they'll go under the water, and then they'll come back out again. 
Now, it tells the story of Jesus Christ. So it, you stand there, it tells the story of Jesus' life. But then as you go under the water, it tells the story of Jesus' what? His death. You catch the picture there? You go from life to death. But then after that, the next part of the story is coming back out of the water, which then tells what part of the story? His what? His resurrection. Yes. And so a person who stands here and who is baptized and now comes back out of the water says, you know what? I believe that. I believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again for me because I'm a sinful person. I need to have an answer for that. I believe. And so when people watch and see this happening, there is a koinonia experience. You're thinking to yourself, wait a second. When people are being baptized, I don't even know who they are. How can there be koin? How can we share in that? It's only one person. No, it's, it's, it's all of us. Because even though you might not know the person and you don't, might not even know their name, when you see somebody who goes under the water and comes back out again, there should be something inside of you that says, you know what? Yes, I believe that too. And I don't know who they are, but we share the greatest thing ever, Jesus Christ. We were in the Dominican Republic, and at the end of the week, we would um, typically do baptisms of the people in our group. So our group, some adults, some teens, they were being baptized. And so I remember distinctly, we'd go to this pool that was in town. <clears throat> we'd walk in, and there'd be music thumping. I mean, loud music. I mean, they were having a, a pool party at this public pool. And we walked in, and I'd be like, um, Mr. Uh, pool Manager, uh, talking through an interpreter, we like to do a baptism here just for a few minutes. And he's like, oh, okay, that's fine, you know? So the music stops. People in the pool are kind of like, hey, what's going on here? And so they kind of make some room for us, and we get into the water. And uh, we then start baptizing people in the water, one after the other. And I remember the Dominicans, they were kind of sitting on the side of the pool just watching this take place. Again, we have no language commonality here. And they just keep watching people being baptized. And I remember a few of them were clapping. We're clapping for that. And it, was very, it stuck out to me in that moment that the gospel, the story, it transcends culture. The story, when you tell it, it transcends culture and language barriers and whatever may be there to tell the most important story. And I knew in that moment, they resonated, they understood and believed as well. And so baptism, this is what it's all about. And for the, for the average person who might come in off the street and look at this, they look at someone standing in a pool of water and they go under and come back out and they're like, what's the big deal? But for us who know the story, this is an incredible moment together for the body of Christ. It builds koinonia and an excitement when we say, yes, someone else believes what I believe, the greatest thing ever. And so not only are we going to talk about baptism, and, but we're going to experience it this morning. Let me pray for us. Dear God, we thank you so much for your story. It's not our story. It is the gift that you have shared with us through your son, Jesus Christ. And so this morning, I pray that your church would celebrate and that the koinonia amongst us would grow. You are good to us, and we pray this in your name. Amen. Baptisms never get old, do they? Seeing the story retold is an incredible thing. You didn't know Donnie, but now you know that you have something in common with him that is for eternity. Well, like we said before, we are after this idea of koinonia. And uh, just to review, kids, koinonia means what? It's the S word. It means that we are what? Sharing. That's right. We're sharing something. Just like we shared in that moment. And so as we look at the template of, of what the early church was all about, that should be what we want too. A, a group of people coming together 
we can share these, these moments. And it's all about Jesus Christ. It's all about telling and retelling the story. Here's the issue, though. Baptism is something we do once in the life of a believer. We do that four times a year here at Riverwood. So my question is this. Is there other things that we can be doing, other activities that can build and strengthen koinonia within our own body? Let's take a look at God's word in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. That's kind of the, the verses we've been coming back to. Let's read this together and, um, and see if we can figure out something. It says that and they were devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and koinonia, to the breaking of bread and to the prayers. Okay, so they, when they got together, they studied the word. We talked about that two weeks ago. They studied the word. But notice they also had koinonia. And again, your, your Bible might say fellowship. And then after that word, it's kind of this, it explains what that koinonia was about after the, the comma there. And it was about this things called the breaking of bread and the prayers. The breaking of bread. Now, we use that expression when we have a meal together. You go out to dinner with someone, and you're saying, we're going to, let's break bread. I've been asking the question, can you break bread at Burger King? Is it possible to break bread there? Probably is, right? So you're breaking bread. You're having a meal. But that's not probably what they were talking about here because it is a very specific meal they're talking about. The, and that word the is there, the breaking of bread. And so what is, they're talking about is a very specific meal that happened in the Bible with Jesus. Who can tell me what that might, meal might have been? Any kids know? It's called the last what? I heard a lot of adult voices there. Yeah, what do you think? Yeah, the last supper. Very good. And so this, this meal that Jesus shared with his disciples, they were in this upper room, and they were having the Passover meal. And so he was sharing this meal with his disciples. And then in the book of Luke, it tells us what he did at that meal. At some point, he stopped and he said these things. Verse 19 of chapter 22. He took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to them, saying this, This is, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. You see, what Jesus was doing, he was setting up in that moment a way for Christians to be reminded and encouraged to build up and strengthen their koinonia for generations, from generation to generation, to build the koinonia, a shared event when the body of Christ comes together. See, the problem is this. We are forgetful people. Anybody have problems remembering their phone number? Yeah. This past week, I was, someone asked me on the spot, what was your phone number? I was like, um... And eventually I came up with it, but I was like, you know, we live in this world where we have speed dial this and call my cell phone that. We don't have to remember numbers per se. I remember the good old days where you only had to remember seven digits, right? 526-0579. See, I, I knew that number all the time. And then, you, then we had to know 10 digits. And now kids these days, they have to know their mom's cell phone, their dad's cell phone, a home number. I feel bad for kids these days. It's a hard world we live in, all this remembering stuff. But Jesus knew this about human beings, that we're forgetful people. We forget things all the time. And so that is why we come together to do things like this, to share, to remember. And so Jesus, in that meal, he would take a loaf of bread like we take a loaf of bread here. And it says he broke it. He actually pulled it apart and started passing it out to his disciples. And he would then say, this is my body a symbol of my body. My body is going to be broken. And the, the disciples are probably like, I have no idea what you're talking about, right? It was about to happen. But now we, looking back, we know exactly what he was talking about. I mean, he was going to go to the cross, beaten, hung on a cross. And if 
Jesus said, if you didn't catch that, I, I'm going to take, uh, he takes a cup, and he says, you know what, I took the cup, and he said, this cup, there's a new covenant, uh, and it's about my blood that is going to be shed. Blood? What? What are you talking about? And for the disciples in that moment, they were like, you got to be kidding me, right? This cup that is poured out for you is a new covenant in my blood. W what is he talking about? Now, us looking back, we know exactly what he's talking about. Blood flowed. And what it means by blood is the life. A life was given. Blood symbolizing life. And when you don't have it, you don't have life. And some might say, well, did he have to do that? Did there have to be blood shed, life given? And the answer is yes. Hebrews tells us that without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. And so Jesus is saying, my body will be broken, there will be shed blood, and it is for you. And we look back and we say, you know what? It's the story being retold again. I mean, it's being told in baptism, but now it's being told in communion. And so when we gather together, we, we, we eat and we drink now, to the average person who comes in off the street, again, who, who looks at this and they're like, wait a second, you take a little minuscule piece of bread and a little cup of juice and you eat that together? That seems pointless, right? And Corinthians will tell us that the gospel is foolishness to the world. But then it says this, but to those who are being saved... It is the power of God. When we come together and remember this meal, something unique and special happens. Somebody was telling me, that I haven't read it yet, but I want to, but in between services, someone told me that there's an article uh, on, in the Beacon Journal about uh, having elec electronic communion. You can have e-communion. I don't know what it's all about, but I want to get to the bottom of that. But I, I have some hesitation on e-communion, right? Because communion isn't about being in your home by yourself and having communion. It's about being together. Koinonia, sharing something. And so not just talking about it this morning, we're going to experience it as well. And so this table is open for everyone in this room who knows that Jesus Christ has died on the cross for their sinfulness. If you know that to be true and you believe that, then this table is open for you. Whether you're young or whether you're mature, right? <laughs> this table is for you as we eat together. No matter what gender, no matter what race, no matter what language, no matter what, we retell the story in one loaf of bread, all of these pieces of bread going out to two or 300 people here, coming back to one, telling the one story, reminding us of the story that binds us together. Let me pray for us. Dear God, may your church bind together and may koinonia be on the increase by what you are about to see from your people. And may we find encouragement in sharing a meal together as your body. We pray this in your name. Amen. One piece out of the whole loaf. And if you look around the room, you see the diversity of ages. I'm passing out bread to those who are clearly under the age of 10 and clearly those who are above 10, right? And it's a beautiful thing, the body of Christ, the bread and the cup. And when we come together as the body of Christ, we, we say something so significant. It should be an encouragement to every single one of you. As you look across the room, you're like, yes, other people eat. And when they eat, they are saying that the most important story is the story they believe. And so that's why we take these moments every month to remember.
So let's do this in remembrance of him. Let's eat together. And let's drink. Dear God, we are so thankful for your story that we get to tell to one another. It encourages us. It builds your body. The bond between us is strengthened. Thank you for these moments that we share together. We pray this in your name. Amen. Koinonia is what we're after, right? Koinonia is about sharing something. And this is obvious when we share this, right? We share this bread and this cup. So we've learned about baptism. We've learned about communion. Is there anything else? Because, you know, we do this four times a year. We do this 12 times a year. Is there something else that we can do to foster koinonia in the church body? Well, let's go back to the passage that we were looking at. Bill alluded to that we're going to go back to in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Again, our template of how we're trying to copy and see if we're doing those kinds of things. They devote themselves to the apostles' teaching and koinonia, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. The prayers. The prayers? Uh, the first church gathered for all of these things, but the one that we notice here that we're looking at is the prayers. What were these prayers? Were they Old Testament psalms, maybe, that they were then praying amongst them? Maybe. Maybe the apostles had their own prayers that they passed on to the early church. Maybe that's true. Or maybe they just had a large group prayer experience where one person prayed and others were there in the room with him. Maybe that's what it was all about. We don't know for certain, but what we do know that there was something important about a group of people praying together. And it was, it's correlated to this idea of koinonia, something that we can share together that can strengthen our faith in what God has done or is doing. See, some might sit here and say, wait a second. I see all the time we have someone who prays on Sunday morning, a pastor or an elder, and people sit and they say, you know what? I hear them praying, and that's maybe at times where I'm looking through my Bible or I'm thinking about something else, and I'm getting ready to pull an envelope out or something. You're doing something else, right? But that's not what he's talking about here is because that's not engaging in koinonia. That's doing two separate things. Is it possible to have koinonia when someone is praying and sitting in a blue chair? And the answer is yes. You have a job to do when somebody is praying. And it centers around this idea of the word amen. Anyone know what the word means, amen? It means so be it. Verily, it means I agree. That's true. And so you have a job to do as a person who sits and who sits there and is in the seat praying, right? We've been reading this book on prayer. It's a great book. Um, it's called uh, Praying Backwards. In case you're looking for something to read over the holidays to stimulate this idea of prayer, he talks about personal prayer and how you can incorporate that into your life and what that looks like. Great book, very challenging to pray boldly, specifically. You'll be challenged in, in, in prayer. But he also has a spot there where he talks about corporate prayer. And specifically, when we come together as the church and you sit in the blue chair, do you have a role to play? And this is what he says. It's a paragraph. It's very insightful. The Bible encourages corporate prayer because when God's people unite their hearts, they are more likely to encourage one another to pray, to examine the appropriateness of their prayer, to maintain their prayer, and to express thanksgiving for God's answers. Now, that's a, that's a paragraph in the book, but it's so true. You see what he's saying? He's saying when the first thing that what happens when someone prays and there's a group of people, 
God's people unite their hearts together. And that's like we said before, when you're sitting there and you're hearing something being said, you can say, yes, I agree with that. Because the Spirit lives within you where you sit. It also lives in the person who is praying. You are uniting together. And you can say, yes, I agree with that. That's true. So be it. I pray for that too. And so not only do you have one person praying, but you have two or three hundred people all agreeing that this is what they want to see God do. The hearts of God's people uniting together. Koinonia growing. And sees it also has other benefits. They are more likely to encourage one another to pray. So you hear something prayed about on Sunday morning, you think to yourself, you know what? I'm going to pray about that tomorrow and the next day. And I'm going to write that in my prayer journal. And I'm going to keep praying for that over and over again. This is important. I want to pray that way. And it also allows us to, you see what he says, to examine the appropriateness of our prayers. You see, when one person prays and 300 people hear it, that then allows people to sharpen that prayer. Is that really what God wants? Is that really what he wants for our church? You see, when I'm off by myself praying and I have a journal, I can pray things for myself, for my family, or for, for my job. And I always am wondering, is that really what God wants? Really? Is that really what he wants? Or is that just me wanting what I want? But see, when we bring our prayers forth as a church, we can check to see the appropriateness of it. Is this really what God is challenging us as a body to do? Is this really where he is leading us? Let's pray about this. And if it is, then amen, so be it. Let's pray hard for that. And then the last part, to express thanksgiving for God's answers to prayer. When we pray for something huge and big that is totally out of our own strength and power, that is a walk of faith, and then God answers that, does that strengthen the body of Christ? Oh, yes, it does. And koinonia explodes. And it, it, it explodes in such a way that we want to keep praying, keep asking God for big things. Teach us. Where are you leading us? Your will be done in our lives and in the life of our church. And that is why it's important that when we gather together, that we're praying that we're uniting our hearts together and seeing what God has for us. Koinonia, the building up of, of God's people, sharing together important things. And so that's why when we pray on Sunday mornings, you'll see an elder up here or a pastor, and we, we try to pray for the things going on in our world, the things going on in our community. We pray for missionaries that we support. We pray for our ministries within our own walls. We pray for the word of God. We pray for our people. We pray for all of these things, and we need your help when we pray for these things. To unite with someone who is praying, but then also to remember that God is doing a mighty work, and may we be encouraged when he acts and does. It's a beautiful thing. And so just like we had time where we talked about baptism and we baptized, we talk about communion, and then we had communion, it is only appropriate that we talk about prayer, but then we also spend time praying together. Not just one person, but all of us together. So as I pray, let's pray together. Dear God, we, we come before you, and I thank you so much for your word that tells us about the story. And we are mindful that it is about you and your son, Jesus Christ, and the gift that he is. And I pray for the people in this room that they are strengthened in that resolve that they have. Maybe, who, maybe there's some here who don't understand. I pray your spirit would come alongside and work out those details that they would too also believe. And I pray that same prayer for the people outside of the walls of this church, the people who we live next door to that we're thinking about right now, people that we work with, people we share a, a locker with at school, people who we sit next to at lunch, 
I pray, Lord, that you would give us a boldness to share that story. May your spirit open up opportunities and moments to share that story with others. And Lord, we pray also for the things of our, our body here. We talk about the holidays being a time of joy. I pray for those who are going through a very hard moment and the holidays are mine. They bring up hard memories of maybe people who have passed away or just difficult times in their life. We pray that you would encourage them and bring the people here to encourage them this time of year. I pray also for the ministries of this church, and women's ministry and men's and children's and youth and Celebrate Recovery and Stephen's ministry, all of these different ministries that are used to glorify you and strengthen your body. I pray that you would bless them. I pray for the leaders in those ministries that you would watch over and protect their hearts and their minds. Dear God, I pray for this, this morning, Clint Ungeshuk, who we support as a missionary in Arizona, working with Native Americans. And I know his passion is to train up people who are Native Americans to then reach other Native Americans. And so I pray that you would empower him in his ministry. I pray you'd give him a boldness. I pray you'd give him a clarity. I pray you'd give him perseverance to run the good race of training others to then share the story with their people. I pray for his marriage that is upcoming. You would watch over and protect that as well. Dear God, it is a privilege to talk to you. And to, again, to someone who might come in and see this, they hear someone talking to the air, but we know that we are talking to our Heavenly Father who hears us and cares deeply about the details of life, the details of the things that go on in our church. And so we hand them over to you. By faith, we pray to see you at work and for you to build the koinonia of your people. So thank you for hearing us and listening this morning. We pray this in your name. Amen. Well, we've had a great time together experiencing and talking about koinonia. And as we go today, why don't we stand together as we say our benediction, more scripture about the story that binds us together, the shared experience. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Go in his grace today.